Good morning and welcome to the Trinity Exploration and Production PLC Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Jeremy Bridgler Singh, CEO. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to our 2022 full year results and strategic update. Um, today, we'll be going through a series of slides. There are a number of them here, a lot of information. We'll be focusing on some slides with more detail than others. So today in support, I've got Julian Kennedy, um, Chief Financial Officer, and James Menzies, Chairman of the Technical Committee. And James is here to take you through the exciting Palo Seco area. For those of you who are not as familiar with Trinity and are new to the Trinity story, a quick synopsis on you know, who we are and where we are. We are a Trinidad-centric company. We operate licenses and sub-licenses on the west coast, onshore, and east coast of Trinidad. We produce primarily oil in or around 3,000 barrels for the last three years, which represents around 5% of the national oil production. The Trinidad government has been, in recent times, quite active in terms of promoting oil and gas, and we've seen two bid rounds recently com coming to completion, with a third one coming up soon, and fiscal reform in a positive direction over the last two budgets. Today's session is really aimed at trying to get across three key messages to you around our capital allocation, which the capital allocation plan um, does include retaining cash to shareholders, but it's broader than that. It is about looking at the way in which we choose our projects. Julian will take you through a little bit more on that as it relates to choosing the right projects with the right metrics, namely payback periods and cash on cash returns. We'll also focus on the immediate catalyst that we have in front of us. We are drilling a deep exploration well in the Palo Seco area, the Jacobin well, which we'll go through in more detail. And James will describe to you why that is interesting to us. And also talk about the Buenos Aires block, which at this point in time, or rather we've been successful in our bid for the Buenos Aires block, which adds you know, further runway to the Palo Seco acreage area. And finally, the other last point is around maturing the Galeota field, which houses 69% of the reserves and resources and has the potential to be transformative to Trinity when we unleash and exploit that asset. Just touching on this slide very quickly, we've refreshed the board in recent years, and we've also strengthened the management team. And as a result of that, we have a much clearer strategy, which we are depicting today, and we've got a management team that can now deliver on that strategy. I'll, I'll run you through some, <clears throat> some, some pieces here on our results. I'm not going to dwell on them because you, you've seen these from the annual report and from our release. Um, the, the key thing here is, is our underlying engine, uh, our, our base business, which uh, through the, the operation of our guys in the field, through workovers and recompletions, has maintained uh, production in and around 3,000 barrels a day consistently for, for three years. And that turns out a consistent and improved EBITDA last year. The, the key thing, clearly, everybody is aware of this, is that in at the end of 2021, we hedged our oil price. Uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and we took a 10.4 million hit. You should also be aware that those hedges rolled off at the end of last year, and into this year, we are unhedged. We remain uh, a relatively low-cost uh, producer. Uh, we've, we've popped above $30 a barrel as a result of the uh, cost pressures that, that everybody has seen around the globe as a result of, of that uh, that war. Um, but it is a resilient business and we are challenging ourselves to keep those costs low and to drive those costs down. Rolling on to the guidance that we published yesterday, the range here is, is largely as a result of the, the program around Jacobin. Uh, it depends our production and therefore capex and operating cash flow that flows from that depends on the the, the degree of success that we achieve in Jacobin. Um, James will talk about you know what what the well will penetrate. 
and, and it, it also depends on the you know the time of when we uh, bring the, the the well into into production. Uh, there is a range of capex. We're spending roughly about seventy percent of our capex on growth projects from uh, Jacobin, but also on maturing the the Buenos Aires uh, drill targets for the block that we were we uh, were successful on yesterday. And also the the work to recast the the the, the potential of the Galeota area. Just a, a further word on capital allocation, as 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 Jeremy said, this is broader than a dividend and returns policy. This is a fundamental change in the way that Trinity does business. The E and P world has changed, and Trinity is changing as a consequence. The, the era of, of trophy projects is over. We need to focus on projects that get to a return quickly and that get to a cash on cash return. Well, that involves minimizing the capital that we spend, being much more efficient and prioritizing those projects that we chase. And the projects that we're looking at are, you know, they're, they're fit for purpose for the size of company we are. They are repeatable and so the jacobin style of, of well can unlock uh, opportunities both within the acreage that we they held previously but also in in acreage like buenos aires that we were awarded yesterday for the shareholder returns you know we we have committed to a proportion of the operating cash flow of 15 percent between 50 and 80 dollars a barrel realized uh, part of that will be paid in a, a, in a modest, but we believe sustainable dividend. And beyond that, through either uh, further buybacks or through special dividends. Beyond $80, we're looking to return at least 20% of our operating cash flow uh, to shareholders. Um, ESG is important. You know, we, we are... We have been very focused on the social side. We do a lot with our FedSline communities and we're proud of what we do, particularly with the on the education side in supporting children from those communities uh, beyond the 11 plus. We've also uh, launched a, a scholarship program with the University of West Indies uh, for those uh, for a couple of students per, per year. Um, we've got a robust um, governance uh, on the board and it's something that I am championing in terms of refreshing policies and the framework and, and procedures there. Environment is something that we are working on uh, and we are measuring at the moment uh, our scope one and two emissions. We're sampling wells across our asset base uh, to, to provide that baseline from which we can move forward but we recognize the importance of that in this financial environment. Thanks, Julian. So what are the strategic options? What is the sequence? What's the focus? Um, first off, we have right in the near term, Jacobin, which is part of the Hummingbird play that James will take you through. That's currently in progress. The Buenos Aires block is second in terms of when we're going to activate on that, but it's really good news. So I found out yesterday that we were successful with our bid. And then once James has taken you through those three, those two areas, I'll then take you through what is the third focus area, which is the East Coast Galliota in particular. So now if, if we could switch to the other pack. <clears throat> Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm James Menzies. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, I chair the technical committee for Trinity. We're a committee of the board. So our remit is really to help advise the board and Jeremy on the technical work done within the company. You know, has it got the right resources? Is it the right people? Are they looking at the right things? And uh, so we're not, we're not an executive team. Uh, we are advisors, but the committee is made up of experts in geology and geophysics from the outside world. So we bring in really leading edge uh, geophysicists, for example, that are experts in acquisition, processing and interpretation. We have very good geologists that we can bring in to work with the teams in Trinidad. Um, so I'm gonna take you through the uh, mature Southern Basin where 
you know, Trinity's onshore acreage sits. And just as we get into there, uh, looking at this slide, I hope you can see this uh, satellite image of eastern Venezuela and the island of Trinidad, which is just at the top of the picture there. Um, and what I want to show is the eastern Venezuela basin is a very, very prolific, as I'm sure you know, you know, Venezuela has been a big oil producer. And what you're seeing there is the Orinoco Delta that is splurging sediment out towards Trinidad. Trinidad sits very, very close to Venezuela. And you can see the sea is, is full of sediment, which gives rise to um, the beaches of Trinidad not being spectacular. They're not Caribbean blue seas um, because of this, this sediment that comes from the Orinoco Delta. But if you, if you go to Tobago, which is in the uh, leeward side to the north of Trinidad, you'll find lovely, lovely beaches. So that's where you should be going on holiday. But over time, this Orinoco Delta has moved around. And I'm going to show you where the reservoirs sit. But you know, in the last six to 10 million years, that delta has moved. And it's given pulses of sediment towards Trinidad. So you know, I'm going to keep it geology light, but there are some simple things that you, know, you, can, you can follow. Um, we're going to talk about um, how things were done in Trinidad traditionally. It's a very unusual um, setup we have there, as you'll see. It's like nowhere else in the ENP world. We're going to look at the 3D seismic and what we've learned from it and what it means for Jacobin and the hummingbirds in the lower cruise. And I'll explain what that means in a sec. And then the lower forest, which is a very prolific interval, which I'll show you. And we've got a new model there, which we, we uh, have insight on. And then why is this important for Buenos Aires, which is this new block, why we like it. So the first thing I want to start with is um, onshore Trinidad, it is very mature. So there's a, a slide here in the, in the presentation which shows the onshore well density. There have been 13,000 wells drilled onshore. I mean, that's a huge number. And if you just look at where those wells are located, you'll see a massive concentration in this area called the Southern Basin in the southwest of Trinidad. And what I like about this map is it also shows, not only the, the activity that's been going on, but it shows some of the structural trends. So you can see some, some lineaments. I'm going to try and draw a line here, you know, going, oh, no, I won't. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I will be able to draw a line. Um, there we go. Let's try that. Uh, going along here, see there's a there's a lineament here, then the next anticline sits down here. These are the high, the structural highs that uh, people have been drilling wells on. And so you, you can get a good sense of the uh, of the structural style, even without looking at any geology whatsoever, just as well where wells are located. The other lineament you might pick out is a is a line which goes like this. It goes yeah, I kind of got that wrong, but it's it's called the it's a fault. It's called the Los Bajos fault. I'll show you on the map in a second. But that has given rise to a lot of drilling, and it shows you how important uh, faults are to where oil is trapped in this onshore play. Before I leave the slide, the other thing to note: drilling started here in 1857. It has been going on 150 years or more. I mean, it's insane. Uh, but really, they got after it in 1906 with mechanical wells, uh, and over three and a half billion barrels of oil has been produced out of this basin, along with 12 TCF of gas. So it's prolific, and it's very, very mature. Now, with all that well data, which is unusual in EMP to have so many wells, what is also very unusual is we have hardly any seismic. So if we look at the seismic lines in 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 uh, onshore Trinidad, they're very sparsely spaced. Uh, there's not much of it. The quality is a bit iffy. But there is some 3D seismic. And on this map, we, we're out showing the outlines of the, of the 3D, which the state company has acquired over time, but really kept to themselves. Because this hasn't been readily available to the outside world until we came to the license round, which we're going to talk about. And the one of particular interest to us is this one outlined in red called the Northwest District 3D, which covers the basin that Trinity operate in uh, principally. So lots of wells, very little seismic. Um, in terms of the reservoirs we're going to be talking about, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to go heavy on this, but remember the Orinoco Delta splurging sediment out from the, from the southwest. 
This is a section of the reservoirs in onshore Trinidad going from west to east. And I've highlighted here in the box in red is the area we're interested in. And so you can see sort of six million years ago, uh, there, was, there was deltaic sediments being pumped out and it's formed what we call the upper crews, the upper and lower crews, the deltaics. And we're gonna talk about that. That's the reservoirs we're really interested in in Jacobin. And then higher up, we have the forest interval. So you'll see the, the upper forest and the lower forest. And that is the main uh, producing unit that we see in the Palo Seco area. So where you've got that high density of wells, most of them are producing out of that forest, the lower forest interval. So they are our key reservoirs. The other thing I'd, I'd draw your attention to is there's some shales. You see on this, on this, this chart, these little, the dark brown gray are shales and they're soft squidgy sediments that allow us, and they're important for how we see the structure evolve here, but they're on unconformities and they allow, they, they basically take up a lot of the movement of the rock. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why that's very important for us in, in understanding the structure and the, uh, the picture that we have in, in Palaseco. Having said that, I'm going to move on to how did we how, how did we find oil or go looking for oil in a mature basin that has no seismic and millions of wells? And the trouble is you're almost deluged by well data. It's, it's so much of it, trying to make sense of it is extremely difficult. And the way it was done is, is geologists would assume we had a plain dip. And in this map, it's dipping away to the, to the southeast. And you can see a cross section there showing a well top. So they're taking a formation top and trying to correlate it. However, the, the, the correlations are not giving you a picture of a nice plain dip. They had no idea what the subsurface structure looked like. And so the geologists basically put faults in where they can't correlate a nice trend. And so they put a fictitious fault or something that's not really seen in reality, but they think must be there because the correlation doesn't work. And so you end up with a lattice, what we call a chicken wire of dip and orthogonal fault. And you end up with this series of cells that we're showing on this map. This is a real life structure map um, from the cruise interval in Palo Seco. And you can see it's just a, a, you know, a, a lattice of cells. And what they would do is then they'd look in each cell and see how much oil uh, that could hold each cell. And they'd look at the wells within it and see how much oil had been produced. And they'd take one from the other and, set, and come up with an idea of how much oil might be remaining. And that would be a net oil sand map. And so over the page here, giving an example in the same area, on the left is your chicken wire, on the right is the net oil sand map. And they're shading it here in green where they see oil still present. The dark green is showing a high concentration of oil where they believe there should be a lot of oil left behind. So how it was done is they would look for these dark green areas and go looking for spaces in between the wells that have been drilled in the past to look for new locations. And this, of course, is a super mature basin. So you're looking at very closely spaced wells and very, very small areas to go drilling in. Um, but largely, and, and really this is targeting the, the lower forest, as I mentioned. So you can see pretty much there isn't, you know, we can see where there's, there's oil seems to be left behind. We don't know why. There is no coherent geological explanation as to why it's there. It's, it's simply a mechanical calculation that's been done. Um, but nonetheless, this is the technique that's been used for decades and decades and decades. Now, um, Trinity uh, elected a, a couple of years ago to try and understand the subsurface a little bit better. Now, there's a map here we're showing on slide eight of this presentation, which is the onshore geology of southwest uh, Trinidad. And the first thing you see is that Los Bajas fault that I tried to highlight earlier that cuts across. You can see it's a, you know, it's a transform fault. It's, it's very, very obvious. And that has been an important fault for trapping oil. We're also highlighting Trinity's acreage in Palo Seco, south of that fault in blue, and in Faisabad to the north of that fault. So they're their two uh, operated areas that we hold right now. And the Northwest th uh, District 3D seismic is also highlighted. So it covers a huge amount of that area. And Trinity acquired for circa $1 million two 
uh, pieces of that 3D over their existing acreage, Palo Seco and Faisabad. And we bought that seismic and we put a lot of technical effort. In the last two years, we, we put some, what I'd call technical heavy guns here. So we, we, we put in some experts to work that data hard. Now, the data is challenged. I'm gonna show you some lines from it in a second. It's not easy, um, but we believe we persevered with it for this long and we've actually come up with an understanding of what the structure looks like. And why this is important is because actually no one else has done it. The only people to have seen this data so far is the is Heritage, the, the state company and the ministry. But the people from the outside didn't really see it until this license round is the first time they had, had access to it, really. Here's a line uh, across the Palo Seco area. You see it's a dip line. Um, it shows well locations. All those wells kind of terminate in, 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 they're really producing from the area between the blue and the green. So that's our lower forest interval. It's a prolific zone out here, very closely spaced wells. And you can see someone's interpreted a red fault going down that, the middle of that line. It doesn't look obvious, um, but we see big displacement down deep. So the purple and blues in the deep section are heavily offset and only minor, minor offsets up shallow. But nonetheless, those minor offsets do trap oil. And we would uh, think that the bigger offsets have got actually better chance of trapping oil. So that gives you a sort of example of the kind of seismic data quality we're talking about, um, which was, was challenging. We did make a structural interpretation based on that. And it was pretty hard work, to, to, be, to be honest with you. I mean, it wasn't, a clear, it wasn't clear initially, but when you work the data, you can come up with a fault pattern that seems to be coherent. On this slide 10, we're showing the fault pattern from Faisabad. So this is up in the north. It's a very difficult area seismically. It sits on an anticline. The seismic quality is particularly bad. Um, but nonetheless, we have had the experts come up. They've come up with these faults. So on the left-hand map, we can see the black lines of faults. We're also showing these shaded areas labeled one, two, three, four, five. These are uh, high net sand oil areas. So these are, these are what we think is the sweet spot that we've, we've identified. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can see that. There is no structure on that right-hand map. That's purely from calculating what's available in a cell. But when we marry it with the structure map, we see that there's a coincidence. For example, uh, one, the area one, sits on the high throne side of that fault. Uh, this area down here, four, sits on the low throne side of that fault. Two sits be between two faults on a high. So we can now start to explain why we have areas of high concentration where in the past we were just going off uh, calculating it from, from a kind of ran, a random lattice and a bunch of wells. So we now start to see that there is a, a coherence between uh, that net oil sand and uh, the, the structural model. When we look in Palo Seco on slide 11, we can see quite clear, it's much better. The data quality improves radically down here. And now we map quite big fault trends through this area, sort of roughly going almost north-south, sort of northeast, southwest, um, some big faults, which give rise to big structural closures. And, you know, you'll, you'll be ahead of me, I'm sure, in, in thinking that, yes, these structural trends are absolutely coincidence with where we see concentrations of oil in the shallow section. So these, these maps are the lower crews, it's the deeper reservoirs, and all the production comes from up shallow. In the, in the lower forest, largely. Um, some wells have penetrated this interval, so we know this play works, and there is oil produced from here. So it's not a, it's, we're not looking to open a play here, but um, it's, it's largely un, unexploited. So here we have the uh, two intervals in the lower crews. You can see the structural configuration, um, and it, this is what's basically driving a series of structural prospects throughout Palo Seco that we are calling the hummingbird portfolio. So, we have eight to nine that sit within our, our acreage. Some of them, some of those spill out into neighboring blocks. Some of them spill out into PS4, which is a recent acquisition of ours. Um, uh, but we have a series of prospects which we believe are structurally controlled and which have demonstrated the trapping ability by the shallow interval and which we've seen oil produced for down, down dip in other air parts of the block. 
The best of these is Jacobin, and it's highlighted here on this map, on, on uh, both maps here, on the west side, on the low side of quite a big fault. Um, and that's going to be an important fault for forming the trap. So here on slide 12 is a cross-section of Jacobin. And also the, the block map, if you like, on the left is showing the location of all our other hummingbird um, prospects. And on this cross-section, we can see lots of wells going into the shallow lower, lower forest producing oil and green patches are, are basically oil bearing reservoirs. This is a certain ex extent schematic, but you, you get the idea. What we're in, I mean, we're we going to drill this well through this lower forest. So we are going to find oil up there. We're reasonably confident of that. Uh, but really the prize is down deep in this, this lower cruise section um, here where we're looking at trapping against that fault. And we can see three zones. Uh, we call it the TS6, 7, and 8, where we believe there's reservoir going to be present and a very good chance that we're going to have uh, hydrocarbons, which, which are, are, are undrilled. It's going to be uh, virgin pressures down there. Um, in terms of uh, the, the well itself, over the, over the page, you can see the, some of the numbers around it. Uh, we're looking at a one in three to one in four chance of success for individually for these, these kind of sands. However, when we do the probabilistic analysis and you wrap up the chance of finding something from these different intervals, the chance are quite good. It's at 63% that you will find at least one oil zone. Now, in expiration terms, 63% is very, very good. You, you rarely find anything north of 50. I mean, that is a, more of an appraisal, actually, rather than expiration. So the chance of success looks attractive. Um, in terms of size, when we do the probabilistic analysis, we think the mean outcome is 5.7 million barrels in place. If we want to dream, there is a P10 number, i.e. there's a 10% or less probability that we could find 10 million barrels down there. So for Trinity, you know, the, in terms of world scale exploration, this is not big. In terms of Trinity scale exploration, it's huge. You know, Trinity, and I'll come back to this later, Trinity is an 18 million barrel company. If we have got eight or nine prospects here that have a mean of five to six million barrels, you start to get, and admittedly that's in place, but you can see we are gonna impact our reserve base pretty substantially if this play is proved and starts to work. Okay, um, so that's the deeper structure in the lower crews and the hummingbirds. Now, I just want to have one more uh, insight to tell you about because this is really important, particularly for Buenos Aires. And this is when we look at the 3D seismic in the lower forest, so it's in the very prolific zone up shallow. And what we see on the 3D, and I hope even the non-geophysical uh, audience might be able to pick out, is in this interval in the middle of this line, you can see two horizons. I think one's called BML, the other's called TCR. But between them, we've interpreted a bunch of little faults and some dips, which we can correlate very well over the 3D, that look discordant, i.e. they don't look to be parallel with all the other bedding. There's something going on there. There's a structure. Now, we didn't know if that was real. Was it noise? Was it something out of the plane? You know, seismic can fool you in all sorts of ways. But actually, we can map it out, and we believe these really are fault-bounded um, structures. And it's unusual to have that much uh, dip uh, reversal from, from a fault-bounded structure that actually disappears. You can see you can't, you can't continue these faults into the subsurface. What's happening is they're soling out in that shaley zone at the unconformity that I mentioned at the start of this presentation. So you've got very tight roller, the very tight faulting, and you are creating a series of compartments which, which are trapping oil. This zone is drilled up to death. I mean, we, we've got hundreds of wells in here, so we know this works. Um, and this is how uh, the lower forest interval is being trapped. And this and it explains why you can find oil all over the block in, in areas where you wouldn't normally expect to see it. So I want you to hold that thought um, I'm going to skip through this just to say, look, this, 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 this lower forest interpretation of the rotated blocks and the deeper faulting, the two critical things. Um, and I want you to hold the thought, and we're going to look at Buenos Aires now. And why is this important? Because when we look at Buenos Aires on slide 16, 
it's outside of that heavily drilled up area. In fact, it's what we would call a virgin block. No one has drilled here, it's been avoided. Why has no one been here in a, in a, in a basin that's had drilling for 150 years, no one's bothered? Um, and the reason over the page is this. When you look at a seismic line across it, it's a big hole. It just goes into a saucer. And if you ask any explorationist, they ain't gonna go looking for oil in a, in a sink line. So it's been untouched. Um, however, uh, on this line, which runs from our Palo Seco blocks on the right-hand side across the air and sink line, we have learned a lot from this 3D seismic about what traps the oil in that interval, that lower forest interval. And we think we can take that across into this Palo Seco block. Now, when we came to look at this uh, bid round, the ministry were giving away this 3D seismic. We had paid $1 million two, two years ago, and it was a killer. I was so annoyed to see this being given. But actually, it's turned out to be brilliant because no one else has had two years to work it and understood quite what it means in the way we have. And you know, we believe this has given us a real competitive edge that no one else has. When we look at this line on slide 18 of the Palisade area, here we have our little fault compartments. Here it's lovely, we've flattened it here to really emphasize these fault compartments and, and you know, how well they're imaged. Uh, now, when we go into, into Buenos Aires, in this same interval, we see the same thing. We see these rollovers, the discordant nature of these things. They look a little bit strange, but with this high quality 3D, which the ministry kindly supplied to us, we can map out uh, what these things look like. And if I slip onto slide 20, here it is. You can see a lattice. Lo and behold, there is a lattice of faults that we see right on the block boundary going into the hole, very, very close to our Palo Seco acreage. Um, and these things, are, if you like, this is a chicken wire map that actually is made from real data, from seismic. This isn't something that's been dreamed up by the geologist because nothing matches. This is actually hard data that's uh, supplied this to us. On this little snapshot, we're looking at four or five of these little fault panels, but they're extensive. When we chase this down into the hole, there's a lot of them. And so over the page here, you can see in context, in the middle map, yeah, we get a lattice network. All of these we think have potential to trap oil. We're 500 meters from the block boundary of Palo Seco, where the play is, is prolific. And we have the deeper lower crews, the Jacobin lookalike structures are also there. So suddenly we've got uh, a, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to prospective drilling targets. Uh, if we can make this work, if this, this hypothesis plays out, we have the opportunity to double, treble, quadruple our reserve base just from this one block alone. And in terms of size, you know, these things are, well, the deeper ones are three to 11 million barrels in place, the shallow ones, you know, seven to nine million barrels in place, and we can see more than 10 of them. So th when Jeremy mentioned this is scalable and repeatable, this is what he meant. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that slide. So, you know, effectively, I think this has given us, we think the 3D has given us a real competitive advantage. We were, you know, it was annoying to pay a million bucks, but actually, that's, it's been a bargain. That is the biggest bargain Trinity have, have had. Um, we've had to push the data to the limits. This is why we don't think any, any other company can just pick up this data and understand it. We've worked two years and we put really, really top end interpreters on a world-class scale to work on this. Uh, and I don't think anyone else out here can, can really replicate that anytime soon. I think even the state companies recognize the effort we put in and actually are wanting to understand better what we've learned. So I would say Trinity are leading the market in, in the knowledge of this play and how it's working. Uh, I mentioned the resource potential, you know, I don't need to go on about that and the repeatability, but you know, I want to leave you with the idea that we've got a competitive edge, we've got lots to chase here, we've got very good chance of success, and there's good reasons founded in hard geology and geophysics as to why this, this is an excellent chance of working. And I'll stop blathering.
Before we, before we move across from this, um, just to add to what James has been saying, I think it's fair to say that based on this technical work, you know, the board and the management team are quite excited. And therefore, yesterday, finding out that we were successful with the bid, you know, certainly was, was something that we very much welcomed. In addition to the, the rocks that, as James has described them, um, the Buenos Aires block itself comes as a head license. So it's a full EMP license, which is an upgrade to the sub licenses that are 500 meters next door. It means that we will have control over our operatorship and as well as the, in terms of the commercial nature of it, this will not have two royalties associated with it as the sub-licenses do. This will only be one royalty being paid into the state company. In this instance, their heritage will be a 15% partner for which we will carry them through the expiration phase, which consists of various G&G studies as well as drilling four wells. Could I, could maybe I could just finish one point I think it's important on this bid round, and I'm going to leave it. Um, we, uh, Trinity only bid for one block. There are, there are a whole stack of blocks up, so, uh, up uh, on our phone. You'll have, you'll have seen other companies talk about their awards. We were only interested in this one, and we bid hard to get it. Uh, and that speaks to the fact that this is the one that really excited us. Sorry. Thanks, James. Could we switch back to the first presentation? Thank you. So moving on to Galliota on the back of you know, what James has said, a hard act to follow there, certainly, but Galliota, to remind you of what it means to us, you know, on the, the next slide, um, Galliota as a proportion of the group's reserves, it, it dwarfs the reserves and resources. You're looking at, you know, 69% of the reserves and resources being held within the Galliota block, 46 million barrels, and 46 million barrels, which actually in late 2021, we had that a CPR done or competent persons report, which essentially is a third party taking a look at the reserves and resources that we had in Galliota, and they validated that. The, the reserves auditor, Netherlands Sewers and Associates, came within a very close tolerance range that has given the board and management comfort that the management view of reserves is quite solid. And as an example, next door to that, you know, the, the reserves and resources pie chart and donut, is a reminder of what a portion of those contingent resources could look like by way of a production graph if we had exploited them. And, and this is the ECHO project that contemplated drilling eight wells into the, um, the Tegal discovery well area. And it, it, doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually exploit all of the two C resources, just half of that. But you can see that that sort of type of production profile on top of what we do can be very transformative for us. So what are we doing with Galliota? We commenced the farm down process in late 2021. We paused that in May 2022 when the fiscal reform that we are anticipating um, did, did not materialize. There was subsequent uh, fiscal reform proposed in the 2022 budget that was read in October. Um, that's been legislated for in early um, 2023 to some extent. It did go a certain way in terms of improving the economics for the, um, the Galliota block, but it's not quite exactly what we were lobbying for. We will continue to lobby both as you know, an individual company, but also with other upstream operators to demonstrate the value of some of these projects if the fiscal take is correct. Um, but further to that, you know, in the farm down process, we, we learned a lot of things. There were some really top class companies in there. They looked at the subsurface, they looked at the surface solution. And when it came to the surface solution, what we were proposing was in essence a project that was gonna cost somewhere between 200 to $250 million, which is quite a lot in terms of capital to put up front to risk towards a project. And we've reflected on that. And as Julian has said, the EMP world has moved on. When you're thinking about capital efficiency, part of that is looking at the capital intensity up front. So we are looking to reduce the costs, the upfront costs of a project, you know, probably perhaps 25% uh, of what it used to be before. Therefore, we're looking at, you know, how can we change the concept? Instead of putting a platform down, is there a different way to approach this? Well, <clears throat> we've commenced um, a, tender, uh, a tender process. Um, we, we have received um, proposals from various companies, engineering houses, to help us work through that. And the intent is that we'll commence working with one of those houses in the near future and in the next month or two, work up what that concept will look like so that we can, in September, in or around there, when we return to the market with the interims, describe to you know, what that concept looks like and perhaps put some scoping metrics around that. Further to that, we are um, the other aspect of the Galliota field that we're looking at is within the existing Trinzes field where we produce 1,000 barrels or so every day. There's still 2P reserves, 2C, 
and even to you reserves there in our own infrastructure that's already there. So you're looking at an opportunity, perhaps, you know, to put a drilling package onto one of those platforms, drill into existing well slots and, <clears throat> and exploit reserves that are within the field and that can be, again, fiscalized very quickly. So projects, short cycle times, low capital intensity. So recapping that into your, know, what does that mean with those three strategic choices? And, and this graphic that you see here excludes the outer trenches or the, you know, the echo type development that we showed two slides before. Well, the, the production here, the graphic on the left-hand side, which is very similar to the one that we showed you know, in or around um, the 2021 final year results last year, um, shows a base production that's quite resilient. And then on top of that, you see a risk and on risk profile reflecting development of Jacobin and other hummingbird type um, prospects moving forward with Buenos Aires and then on the East Coast looking at the infill drilling in Trinitas. And on Buenos Aires, we actually didn't touch on it, but the, the plan is to get to drilling in half two of 2024. And the reason that we're looking at that is it's two pronged. Um, one on Buenos Aires, we need to <clears throat> work up the prospects, which we'll have by the end of the year from a subsurface and drilling perspective. And then from an environmental clearance standpoint, we need to get a certificate for environmental clearance in advance of that we have to conduct an environmental impact assessment <clears throat> we will conduct that over the course of this wet season and into the dry season next year because we need data for both make the application and then once that has come through the intent is to drill in half two of next year in buenos aires so you're looking at jacobin now that we're drilling we should get results from jacobin in early july if jacobin is successful there will be follow-on drilling in jacobin late 2023 into early 2024, drilling in Buenos Aires in half two of 2024 with the potential for a well um, in the outer Galeota as a, very much as an outlier in late 2024 as well. So putting those all together, looking at the operating cash flow and the guidance, funding strategies to, is quite clear an area that we need to work on and Julian is leading the charge in that regard. All right, so to recap, what we've taken you through a, re, you know, a, a refreshed capital allocation policy, moving away from metrics such as NPV and IR with more focus on cash and cash returns and payback periods. We have immediate catalysts in, in play right now with the Jacobin Well, Buenos Aires, the successful bid there is very encouraging for us based on the, the, you know, what James has taken us through. It looks to be a very exciting block that we can get after very quickly with a company of our size, with our balance sheet. And then taking Galeota, which can be a transformative asset, coming up with the right um, option in terms of how do we exploit that and having the right funding solution that aims to minimize the dilutive impact to shareholders. In terms of engagements, in terms of the, the, next, the coming few um, months, we have um, what well, we are in London at the moment, so as, as you've seen, um, our AGM is an in-person event, um, which will be on the 27th of June. Board and um, management will be there. We encourage you to please you know, attend the AGM if you so wish, where you can meet with us and, and we can discuss this presentation and perhaps you know, for the results as at that point in time. That will be followed up um, with Jacobin once we understand where we are there. Um, the usual quarter, quarterly updates will be done um, in mid to late July. There will be other pieces of news flow between July and August as it relates to both Jacobin and Buenos Aires. And then in September, we'll you know, recap where we are and give you some further information on Galeota. And that will include a retail investor event at that point in time, which is likely to be in person. So that's where we are right now in terms of this presentation. I'd like to pause now, um, perhaps as we um, hand back over to the, um, the administrators, and then we look to take your questions. Jeremy, Julian, James, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Thanks. We, we just are reading some of these um, questions. Some were pre-submitted, some were fresh. Um, I don't think we'll have the opportunity to answer all of them, um, but we'll give it a go with some of the, some immediate responses now. 
And then those we have none, so we provide um, you know, written feedback as guided. So the first question so that we've got here is, is the high angle well and horizontal um, as well as conventional infill drilling on hold after you have announced the nine wells hummingbird program? Is there need of fresh funding for the hummingbird program? I think we'll perhaps split that into two. I'll answer the first question and then hand over to Julian on the funding aspect of it. Um, in short, yes, we have paused all other drilling whilst we're drilling Jacobin. The Jacobin well, well which we um, we didn't actually care, uh, discuss through the um, through the presentation before, has the potential in a success case to be you know a, a very high value project for us because the payback period for Jacobin success is one year, and projects like that certainly are going to dominate um, the, the list of projects from a capital allocation perspective. So yes, we paused. We'd like to understand what is happening um, with the Jacobin well. Once we have results, we'll relook the projects then thereafter. In terms of funding, Julian, do you want to have a go with that? Yeah, uh, you know, on, on success, this this has the potential of, of building cash quickly. Um, as, as as we said earlier, we are focused on things that, that can uh, get to pay back very quickly. This well could pay back within a year on success. Um, and and looking to drill again towards the end of the year into early next, it's it's something that we think that we can we can execute on and then move on to um, to to drill in in Buenos Aires. Um, we are looking at a number of funding solutions, which include you know our relationship banks both here and uh, in Trinidad, um, and then more broadly. Uh, funding, you know, we're we're looking at other solutions which could include, you know, prepay for offtake. Uh, it could include for you know a anything with Galiota. It could include some vendor finance, all of which is aimed not to dilute the existing share but shareholder base. But equally, we've, we're also very cognizant of not over leveraging the company. We've got a relatively clean balance sheet. You know, we don't want to get into a place where we're over leveraged. Thanks, Julian. Um, the next question is, <clears throat> any preliminary assessments of hummingbird potential in terms of additional commercial oil reserves? James touched on this, I'll hand over to James to explain some more. Yes, certainly. I mean, we gave um, some numbers around Jacobin, um, which was 5.7 million barrels, is, is the mean uh, in-place figure for, for that prospect. And the, the other hummingbird prospects are of very similar size. So that was 5.7, it was 10 million barrels in place in the upside case. That would imply somewhere between one to two million barrels recoverable in that range. And you know, there's eight of them. So uh, that's, that's the sort of scale we're talking about. Um, and as I mentioned, you, know, you, you may not get excited about it if you compare it to other EMP companies size prospects, but for this company, it's extremely material. So big impact uh, from those uh, prospects. Thanks, James. The next question, Bruce Dingwall was always a great advocate of meeting and talking with shareholders face to face. Post COVID, there's been plenty of opportunity to re-engage in this manner. So why does the present board appear so reluctant? Well, actually on the 27th of this month, our AGM is in person. It will be um, held here in London. We encourage you know, everyone who is interested to meet with the board and management, please turn up. And um, that will be the first um, resumption of in-person meetings, but we certainly intend to do so on a more regular basis. And in September will be the second one. Um, there's uh, another question. What is the status of the horizontal well? I think we've touched on drilling and what does that mean in terms of you know, the Jacobin well capital allocation or why we pause. But the horizontal well, you know, to provide an update, we told the market back in November, I think of last year, that we had paused because um, there was a tool we needed. It was a, a gravel pack extension tool. Um, that tool was then manufactured um, on behalf of us and is sitting in the supplier's warehouse in Trinidad waiting to be deployed. Um, again, the, the Jacobin well is a precursor to that, but also we've seen on the ground in Trinidad with the supply chain moving away to Ghana and Suriname that we need to, to find a way to strengthen the supply chain again in Trinidad. And this is something that all operators are facing and therefore why we're going to work together as a group of operators to, to re-strengthen the supply chain in Trinidad. 
Another question, are any changes post the rig accident fire? So this, this refers to the Bravo fire that happened earlier on this year. I mean, first of all, we were very fortunate that the fire was contained as it is. And that is a reflection of the, the great work that was done on the platform by the operators there. Subsequent to that, um, you know, we, we shut in production at that point in time across the entire field. We brought up um, the other platforms, Alpha and Delta, they, they, within 24 hours. And the Bravo platform we were looking at, you know, that we were thinking that we were probably going to be shutting for some time, but we worked with the ministry and having cl had built close relationships with the ministry, which were very current from the ABM 151 project, we were able to demonstrate, you know, sound engineering, HSC and operation practice. And the ministry allowed us to resume operations you know, within seven days. That is a, a good outcome, a reflection of strong relationships, constructive relationships between the Ministry of Energy and Trinity. Um, but post that, we have had, um, and, and with, the, with Mark Kingsley joining us um, soon thereafter, um, we've had a review of the way in which we operate the Trinitas field, and there, there have been a number of recommendations to do so in a safer manner that also protects production. And we are looking at actually upgrading um, the, the HSC aspect as it relates to firefighting, but more so the operational philosophy on Trinitas to reduce exposure of risk to life and limb and environment. Final question I'd like to um, point to is a uh, is great, highly detailed geology lesson there. Um, BOPD results from Jacobin well early July. Will this include the virgin pressured wells on the way down? I perhaps should handle it to James. Please. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I guess the uh, the question is about flow flow tests from Jacobin uh, early July. I think Jeremy put um, you know the timing of Jacobin results on his timeline. There is probably going to be after the AGM in 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 yes. You know early early to mid July, but you know God laughs at your timelines for drilling well, so um, don't. <laughs> Uh, you know, obviously, we want to see the results as much as anybody, um, but uh, we, we have to just conduct the operations and, and do it. In terms of the um, what we'll see on the way down, uh, and there's an interesting point here. I think we're going to go through the lower forest, the prolific lower forest, on the way down to the deeper section. That is not virgin pressure. That's the exhausted kind of shallow uh, unit that everybody's been producing from in this in this area. Um, however, just to emphasize a point, in Buenos Aires, it is all virgin. So we'll be drilling that prolific uh, unit in Paleseco in Buenos Aires block where no one's drilled ever before. So we'll be getting virgin pressures over there, as well, of course, in the deeper section will also be virgin pressures. So we would expect better looking flow rates, frankly, all, all other things being equal from a Buenos Aires well than we would necessarily from a Palaseca well, but the the deeper lower crews should be should be virgin pressured and yeah, you know if it works this this should be flowing very nicely. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, James. Jeremy, Julian, James, thank you very much for that. I think you've addressed those questions you can from investors, and of course the company will review all questions submitted today, and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Me Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. Jeremy, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Thanks very much. I think I just want to re take the opportunity to remind everybody, you know, about the Nathan catalyst that we have, Jacobin, and the exciting Buenos Aires block, as explained, you know, so eloquently by James. Um, aside from that, the, the, the increased management capability, we are looking to bring Galio on. We have a much clearer, focused strategy. We're going to deliver on those strategic options, maximize the, the, the value of our portfolio. And thank you again for your, your time this morning and your continued interest in Trinity. Jeremy, Julian, James, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Trinity Exploration and Production PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.